you would please imagine with me a moment one of your favorite possessions. Get it in your mind. Do you have it? Maybe it's a saxophone or a guitar. Or perhaps it's a bicycle or a motorcycle or a piece of art or your favorite book. Really look at it and see it. How does it feel? What other objects surround it or go with it or connected to it in your mind? Do the people in your life know how you feel about this thing? How are their lives impacted by your relationship to this object? I'm a marketing professor at Hyder College of Business at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, and I study the relationship between people and objects. I've had the honor and the privilege of working with numerous students like April Hughes over the years, and I've also worked with a number of mentors and colleagues and students who are now my friends as well. You will see some of their names on my slides tonight because I think it is only appropriate that you understand that these ideas are not just mine, they do not stand alone. A good idea never does. I receive my ideas for what I study in my research from the people around me who inspire me, most especially my children. This is a picture of my son, who is now eight years old, but for at least the first seven years of life, his best friend was Blue. This is Blue. This is Blue the blankie that's wrapped in, around him. Blue was a superhero cape. Blue was helped to construct tents, and he wiped away tears. And there were times when Blue was lost. And when Blue got lost, his sisters could attest to you that it was painful for all of us. <laughs> okay. And that is really one of the key ideas that I'm talking about in my talk today, is that the ownership that someone else has of a possession impacts all of us. And Jackson's ownership of that blue blanket impacted all of us in his family. It's the American dream to have a home, perhaps like this one, and fill it with possessions that we can use to create memories in our own lives and that we can use to give our children the best possible life. For the last 25 years, it's been my honor and privilege to interview a number of people, including my friends, about their relationship to their people and possessions. I've talked to a lot of different types of people. I've talked to adults, I've talked to children, elderly people, I've talked to people with different sexual orientations, different ethnicities, different physical and sensory abilities. And the one thing that I find that all of these different types of people have in common is that they use their possessions to tell their life stories. And their stories have helped me develop a better understanding of the relationship between people and objects. This is the home of Bob and Ann Dixon in Greensburg, Kansas. Well, it used to be. And Greensburg, Kansas, one day was hit by an E5 tornado, and the next day, this was Bob and Ann Dixon. And they had to, in the sense of this tornado, make sense of their belongings and their possessions. And so for the last decade, my research has really been focused on exactly that question. How do people make sense of their possessions in the face of traumatic events? In two communities in particular that grabbed my heart and my attention. And perhaps these two communities grabbed my heart and attention because they felt like home to me. They were two rural communities, the rural communities of Wright, Wyoming, and Greensburg, Kansas. And they felt like home to me because I grew up in a little tiny town in Nebraska named Bassett, Nebraska. But I don't think Wright and Greensburg are, are all that different than other communities that we might live in. And so we can get some sense of how communities respond in the face of this trauma and how do possessions play a role in that. So Greensburg, Kansas was hit by an F5 tornado in 2007. 95% of the community was destroyed. 
It destroyed 121 businesses, 95% of the homes, all of the infrastructure was gone, and the community had to decide how to rebuild, and people had to decide, should I stay? Is this home anymore? Two years before that, I had started research in Wright, Wyoming, where 25% of the people were left homeless. And so these two areas, these two communities, led me to three primary ideas that I'm going to talk with you about tonight. The first one of those is that our possessions make us vulnerable. Our possessions, we have personal relationships with our possessions, much like we do people. We have strong attachments and feelings and emotions associated with those possessions. And when objects are taken away from us, particularly involuntarily, we feel like a piece of ourself has been lost. And we also come to realize that we are quite dependent upon those possessions. And that makes us feel pretty uncomfortable because we don't like to believe that we're dependent on things. But if you look at what happens in American culture after an, a, a natural hazard event, we show images of stuff. We talk about things, we talk about the devastation, and we say, you know, what was the magnitude of the event? This was an EF3 tornado or this was an EF5 tornado in, in um, Wright and Greensburg, respectively. We talk about the loss of human life. There were two people killed in, in Wright, and there were 13 people killed in Greensburg, Kansas. And then immediately the story turns to, and the images and the pictures turn to the stuff and the economic impacts. And it's as if those statistics and these images are to remind us that it's, that it's okay to be dependent, that it's okay to have um, possessions play a central role in our life. And it affirms and validates the role that those possessions play in our lives. It tells us that story. Another thing I've found is that suffering in a disaster is different than the suffering of a family, say, who lost their home in a fire. And the reason that suffering is different is because the buffers that were there for a single family are no longer there, right? In a single family situation, the buffer is that the community members take you in and can help you. But in a natural disaster, we share in that vulnerability because we're all hurting. Another buffer that's gone is that in a disaster, unlike when my son Jackson lost Blue, Jackson could find all these other possessions. He has a million stuffed animals, way too many in my opinion. But he could use one of those other stuffed animals as a little buffer for that loss that he was feeling. So vulnerability becomes this shared experience, and in that, we have difficulty in dealing with and making decisions. And we want to explain who or what is responsible for this pain and the suffering that we feel. One of the things that I think is really interesting is people don't blame their stuff for their suffering. They blame the weather. Right? It's the weather's fault. The tornado came and the tornado took our stuff away. We never even question the fact that we should have and feel these strong attachments and connections to these material possessions in the first place. It's the weather's fault, and we blame it on the weather. And blaming it on the weather allows us to rationalize our dependence on these objects. We aren't suffering because we're attached to material possessions. We're suffering because of the weather. So our possessions make us vulnerable. And at the same time, those same things that take some of our power away from us when we're lost, we need those same things, a similar kinds of things, to reconstruct our identity once those things are gone. So now we need new possessions and new stuff to reconstruct that, that our identity and our sense of who we are. And so the same things that made us vulnerable also make us resilient and they help us and they empower us. And so when I say they make us resilient, they allow us to take positive steps in spite of the, 
the traumatic event that we've been through, this adversity. And they also enhance our capacity for future activity. So when we're in this state of shared vulnerability, our capacity for making decisions is reduced. How do we make sense of this? Our possessions tell us how to make sense of it. They tell us we're out of order. You have to sort us. You have to dispose of us. You have to, to take us somewhere where we belong. So our possessions direct us to action and they help us know what to do next. And just putting those things back into order gives us some positive step, step to take. And we collaborate, like in this instance, this is people from Wright, Wyoming, brought their tractors and they started cleaning up the mess and they started, they brought people into their homes and they shared their resources in these amazing sorts of ways to be there for their neighbors. Even damaged possessions can help tell that story and to help, can help bring us together and help us be resilient. Here, these people have used humor to talk about, they've said, for sale, three slash two bedroom with a sun deck, okay? So they're using their possessions to say that even in the face of this, this adversity, we can come together and we can find humor and that we can have a positive outlook in spite of this negative event that's happened in our lives and our possessions can help us to tell that story. We also come to rebuild. This is the home, the new home, of Bob and Ann Dixon. And Bob and Ann Dixon now make memories with their family in this home. And at the same time, this home wasn't just for Bob and Ann Dixon, it was also a symbol of hope and a beacon of hope to the rest of the people in the community. It's okay for you to rebuild. It's okay for you to come back and to, to decide you want to live in Greensburg, Kansas again. This home was really owned by the Dixons, but it wasn't just theirs. It was also owned by the rest of the community. The third idea that's come from this research is that possessions have power. Possessions have power and possessions have energy and those, they, so that human-like qualities that they have of that power and energy, they control our interactions and they shape our identities. And that makes us extremely uncomfortable so we don't talk about it. For instance, these homes have power. These are FEMA homes in Greensburg, Kansas. Thank goodness for the FEMA homes for Greensburg, Kansas, because without them, the community would have never been able to come back. And so these homes exerted power and control over the recovery process for Greensburg, Kansas, because they said, yes, you can come back. But at the same time, these homes said, you're all exactly alike, right? Because Every single one of those homes looks exactly the same. And people said, well, that's not the nature of community. That's not the way our community used to look. That's not the kind of community we ha want to have. We want to have individual homes that give us unique character and identity. So those homes told us to build new ones. Right? So those homes told us, this isn't how you want to live. You want to, build, to, to live as individuals and to build new homes. And so the the homes were telling them, and our possessions and the things that we own tell us what to do. In disaster, we have donations pour in from all over because people see those images that I showed you and they, see, and they, they feel compassion and they want to help because they can relate to that. They can feel what it feels like not to have things. But a lot of times those same possessions that we think will be helpful are not necessarily helpful. In Wright, they talked about it looked like things were pouring in like ma manna from heaven, right? All kinds of things poured in. But then people 
started looking and saying, well, it doesn't feel like we're getting better necessarily, and why doesn't it feel like we're getting better? And, and, and they felt like that the possessions themselves were creating another sort of disaster. These, these donations themselves were creating another sort of disaster in the community. That these, these, these things were taking control of the community and people were fighting over who got what. And part of the reason that was is because there was a mismatch between what people wanted to make themselves whole and what could be offered from the donations. Broken tables, stained shirts, those aren't the things people are looking for after a disaster. They're looking for things that help them feel normal and whole again. Gradually, the communities come back together and things are rebuilt, as in th this is now downtown Greensburg. But again, the things that are available in this market control what people are able to have. The businesses that got rebuilt first in Greensburg were businesses that attracted dollars from the outside, not necessarily from the inside. People, things that people needed to just live there. Although they were really happy the day the grocery store came to town and they said, now we're going to be okay because the grocery store is here. These free ideas, have led to a deeper understanding of the relationship between people and objects. One is that our possessions um, make us more vulnerable. Two is that our possessions help us be resilient. And three is that our possessions control and shape our interactions. I believe that we control our stories. Despite the traumatic events that have happened in our lives, I believe we are in charge of what those stories are but for us to determine that story, it's really important for us to get in touch with the role of possessions in that story. And it's a struggle for power between us and the stuff.